Greetings from Castle Goring, from Nikki, Aurora and from me. Today I'm going to start off on a joyous note because we have something to celebrate. Last night I was at Sadler's Wells for the 21st anniversary celebration of Classically British and Co, which is a black dance company. It was founded by Mark Eli, who is a well-known black dancer. And it was, they now have a uh, space at the Lillian Bailey's studio at Sadler's Wells. They have a new resident composer called Joy Sego. She is a fine composer uh, and I'm going to play something at the end of this segment uh, because she composed a dance for this. It's to celebrate Black History Month and her piece was called Resonance and Resilience. It was choreographed by Dakota Rogers, danced by Sabina Cuckoo and Trayvon Gibson. It was a magical evening. The standard of dance is absolutely superb. They have a wonderful set of dancers. And I think this is something that should be encouraged. And I'm going to tell you why. I was saying to Mark after the performance, I said, you know, you really need to get some major player behind this. And I think Elon Musk would be a perfect fit. <laughs> Don't know Mr. Musk, but he's South African. South Africans are black, they're white, they're brown. So, I, and he has the money. They need major funding. They have been going for 21 years, but with the right funding, they can become a unique and top dance company. And I'm going to tell you why. And I said it last night to Mark and he agreed with me. If you have a black dancer in a corps de ballet with white dancers, he or she will stand out and can actually be a jarring note because a corps de ballet is supposed to be equal. Everybody's supposed to sort of blend in. Ironically enough, because they had the Portobello young dancers there last night, and they ranged from blue-eyed blonde to very dark-skinned. When you have a ballet troupe that is black, even the fair-skinned people of African heritage don't stand out because for whatever reason, we expect a range of colors and therefore there's nothing jarring in, in the color difference. Now, color does matter in terms of costume. For instance, you will have Odile and Odette in different color costumes for a reason. So just for that reason alone, we need a black ballet company. Now, I tell you, one or two people were there whom I've known an awfully long time. Because, of course, Mark founded this classically British and co-ballet company 
21 years ago and has dedicated himself to making it flourish. And But we also had there Joy Seagull, she's a fine composer. We had Dawn Hill, who is the lifetime patron of the Black Cultural Archives at the Black History Museum, 1 Windrush Square, Brixton. I've known her sister since I was 11 years old. Her sister was a very well-regarded pianist called Maxine Franklin. And Dawn's husband, Andrew, was the number two at, oh, what's that organization called that does, oh, oh God, it's escaping me at the moment. Amnesty International, Amnesty International. Sadly, he's died. But she has been a wonderful force for the preservation of black culture in this country. She's originally Jamaican. <laughs> also there was Vincent Osborne. And Vincent is the founder and artistic director of the Black British Cultural, Classical, sorry, Foundation. Uh, and the MC was the actor Kelvin Omar, who appeared with me in A Gangster's Kiss, a movie that was partly filmed at Castle Goring. It was a wonderful evening and so I'm going to ask that now something be posted of, we'll do the photographs first, then we will do Joy's wonderful resonance and resilience.
Well, I hope that was of some interest to you. And now we plunge in with the more nitty gritty stuff. Sarah Samuels says, question lovely lady C. Thank you so much. What are your thoughts and understanding on the divorce rumors of Meghan and Harry? And once they do divorce, will King Charles and Prince William welcome him back? <laughs> well, of course, you notice the divorce rumors have been launched while the King and Queen have been in Australia and Samoa. In fact, last night, the Jamaican High Commissioner would have been in attendance, but he had to be in Samoa with the Jamaican Prime Minister for the head of Commonwealth, head of government of Commonwealth Conference. So too would Patricia Scotland, Lady Scotland, who is the head of the Commonwealth. She would have been there, but she couldn't, so she sent a message instead. Well, isn't it coincidental that all of these rumours are surfacing just when Harry and Meghan are out of the news and the King and Queen are in the news? Doesn't that sort of jar slightly? Doesn't that ring bells? Doesn't that... <gasps> Megan's going to be presenting the Oscar. Oscar night comes, Oscar night goes. Megan presents what? A royal flush? Hmm. I'll wait and see what happens. As I've said for some time now, the marriage is rocky and I don't remember when I said it, but I said it either last year or earlier this year that Harry had called in the lawyers. So you don't call in the lawyers if everything is copacetic. But does that mean they're going to get divorced? I'm not holding my breath. And I don't believe a word they say anymore. If they told me today is Saturday the 26th of October, I would have to look at a newspaper first to see if that is so. Sorry. Will the King and William welcome him back? My understanding is the relationship between the brothers is over. And I suppose uh, even if it became feasible to have an ostensible rapprochement it will never be more than superficial. That's where the brothers are concerned. My understanding is that Catherine will never, she's learnt her lesson. She has been betrayed. And yes, she would be doubtless Uh, superficially accommodating, but only superficially. Now, Charles is a different matter. Harry is his son. He loves his son. There is some room for doubt as to whether Harry was born somewhat defi deficient or whether he became through drugs even more deficient than he presented as being when he was a little boy. 
You love your child as the child is. Does that mean he will be welcomed back? I doubt it very much. Of course, <clears throat> if they're... <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> if there is a divorce, of course, there will be fences mended to an extent. I don't think the family would be ill-advised enough to keep Harry in Siberia. No, they'll most likely exile him to somewhere like the Crimea, the equivalent of what would have happened in Tsarist Russia. And I don't really put much store in rumors, but it would not surprise me if Harry and Meghan at some point get divorced. It wouldn't surprise me if the up and down become, becomes so intolerable that the ups aren't worth the downs. Now, Harry gave up everything for Meghan. Meghan promised him the sky and delivered a whole load of hot air. She worked on his failings, his deficiencies, his jealousies, his insecurities, his lust for attention and recognition. I mean, when you're as dumb as Harry and you were at Eton and everybody else had brains except you, on some level, you have to know that you are the dolt of the century. Maybe he shouldn't have been sent to Eton. Maybe he should have been sent to Gordonstone, where he would have flourished under the physicality and athleticism of the ethos of the school. But anyway, he wasn't sent there. So I don't think anybody's going to welcome him back. And if in the long run he they have to find a space for him. It's going to be as out of the way and as minimal a space as possible. Harry, the global superstar of yore, is never going to be a global superstar again not with the royal platform. And he has shown the world that he's no global superstar without the royal platform. Glo global sensation, but not a global superstar. Marie Nosusi says, Dear Lady C, there is a big difference between you and Tina Brown even though you are both very bright. Thank you. The big difference is that you have always told us the truth about Dan and now Harry and Meghan, no matter what, because you have a strong moral compass. On the contrary, Tina Brown has always followed her own narrative and her own business goals. She has been protect protecting her own interests for two years before telling her true feelings about Meghan Markle. Obviously, she had a book to sell and decided to wait until the American people started to see the light about the two grifters. Now that the mainstream media is telling the truth about Meghan Markle and that she is becoming independent, she has decided to make a lot of noise through a podcast. But Tina continues to praise Harry as the greatest asset of the monarchy, no matter the damage this traitor has done to the country and the royal family. 
One can only wonder what advantage she thinks she can gain from such a lie. Well, I tell you what the advantage is. And I mean, you are right that I go with what I know to be the truth. And let the chips fall where they may. I make it absolutely clear that I am critical when I need to be and I give praise when I need to give it. I aim for the truth. I've paid a price for that. Tina hasn't paid that price. Tina slapped on brown lipstick and sucked up for several decades, very well, very efficiently, very sophisticatedly. Nevertheless, brown lipstick never suited me. Now, what does she think she can gain? Well, she's ensuring that she keeps the channels of access open. Tina Brown wants to be able to feel that if she rings up the palace or somebody who she knows, who knows the king, that she is going to not have them dance around the subject, but that they'll come clean and that she will then monitor the information and dole it out as it suits her. Now it has to be said to an extent everybody does that. I do it as well. It's just that if there is a glaring inconvenient truth that needs to be told, I will tell it. Tina will wait, as she has just shown. Also, she could be helping to pave the way for Harry in the event of a divorce. There have been divorce rumours for some time now. And the first person who said that Harry had called in the lawyers, when he called in the lawyers some time ago, well, Johnny come lately and Jane come lately have joined the party. <clears throat> Tina's very canny and she'll want to continue to maintain whatever access and what she regards as influence that she has, or at least give the impression of having influence beyond that which she actually possesses, or access would be a better word. They all do it. It goes with the territory when you're a journalist or a royal correspondent. And thank God I'm neither. Beth of life says <laughs> some of these names. I shouldn't delight in the downfall of others, but I'll make an exception in Meghan Markle's case. To know that Queen Elizabeth II, after a lifetime of service, couldn't even die in peace because of her, angers me to this day. I have been waiting for this since before they were married, and I'm savouring every second of it. There's no one more deserving of public shaming than that low-life liar. Your sentiments, my dear, are shared by allegions. <laughs> You know, whether Harry and Meghan are going to separate and divorce in the foreseeable future or the more distant future, it is apparent now that she is on the way out. She has been frozen out, not only in Britain, but in Hollywood, that is now apparent. That's why you have the pile on 
of all of those wonderfully courageous people who always come in at the end, but would never ever compromise their pusillanimity by coming in at the beginning. Well, fortunately, pusillanimity has never been my failing. So, but if you wish to exult, please feel free to go ahead. One could actually say it would be unjust of you to not exult. After all, Megan has earned the right to your contempt. It would be really rather churlish of you to not give her her just desserts, wouldn't it? RN says, the Democrat Party takes a, talks a lot about white supremacists when they still push and enforce the Racial Integrity Act, also known as One Drop Rule. 1924 to 1967, in this 21st century. That rule was the ultimate white supremacy and said that black blood is a contamination and ruins an entire race. It has apparently caused mass confusion, especially among black people, so much so they don't know what black looks like anymore. RN, thank you so much for that. I am, as I have made clear time and again, so against the diminution of any racial aspect because it is the ultimate in prejudice. And it doesn't really matter whether that one drop was once regarded as contamination and is now regarded as exhilaration and captivation and fascination and everything desirable. It's untrue and it's mathematically unsound. Half and half means one thing. One seventy second means something else. A whole means something. A half means something else. And You are absolutely right. The Racial Integrity Act was even worse than the Nuremberg Laws. I made that point on Piers Morgan's show when Piers said that Harry and Meghan's baby would be black and I said it can't be black. I said, and I made the point about the Nuremberg Laws, that if you were wholly Jewish, you were Jewish. If you were half Jewish, you were Jewish. If you were quarter Jewish, you were Jewish. But it stopped at one eighth. So even the Nazis, odious as they were, had a cutoff point long before the racists of a different ilk and a different nation. And I just find it so perplexing that so many black people today have been allowing themselves to be misled into embracing a principle that is the ultimate in racism. It certainly says something, and I'm not going to say all that I think it says. <laughs> Tara Keels says, Hi, Lady C. Your jewelry du jour is my favorite. 
you look absolutely stunning today. I don't know what day that was, sorry, but thank you. To me, Queen Camilla is not trying to integrate her family into royalty, but into the family. When ordinary divorced people remarry, they try to integrate their respectful families into a new familial union. It's called the blended family, isn't it? She doesn't want her children and grandchildren to be royal. She wants them to be family. Her family should be included. They're her family. Very natural. I think Camilla is marvelous. She has been an exceptionally good sport and she has proven her worth to the royal family and is absolutely the perfect partner for Charles. It took a while for me to recognize this, but I now hold her in highest regard and greatly admire and respect her. Love to you and the Castle Goring Fur family. Can't wait to see the kitties. Blessings. TK in the USA. I've read that out because those are my sentiments exactly. <laughs> so, and it's always better when it comes from someone else than from me, I think. There is so much disparagement of Camilla at the moment. And it has to be said, don't think that all of it is accidental. Harry and Meghan are getting a divorce. Camilla wants to push Catherine off the parapet. Camilla wants her sister to become, to become a princess and her daughter to become an empress. And she wants Meghan to become a goddess. Oh, sorry, that's what Meghan wants. Oh, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry. I didn't realize I confused my notes. So I'm being Meganian. I think you get the drift. Apotheosis says, Dear Lady Colin Campbell, is it true that Princess Anne revised her will and is going to leave a big chunk of her fortune to Prince Char Princess Charlotte as opposed to her children? Utter rubbish. Utter rubbish. Princess Anne has very little money compared to the king or Prince William. Why would she be leaving money to a great niece and not her children and grandchildren? It doesn't make sense. Sorry, it's utter rubbish. I think there is a precedent for a maiden aunt or great aunt leaving money to a nephew or a great nephew and it would have doubtless would have happened with nieces as well the precedent that springs to my mind is princess victoria who was King George V's spinster sister and a great favorite of his. Well, when she died, she left everything to her nephew, Prince George, the Duke of Kent. She left him Coppins, which was her house. She left him a lot of jewelry, etc. And another example that actually springs to mind is Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyle, who also left the Duke of Kent of the day, Prince George. I think he was actually her main heir and she left him some of the Argyle jewellery that she had managed to purloin and instead of to the Argyle family, which she should have done, 
she returned, she, she, she bequeathed it to Prince George. But Princess Louise had no children, nor did Princess Victoria. Princess Anne has children and grandchildren. So I think I've made the point. Mary Walsh says, and this is really interesting. I miss the, this is not the interesting part. It comes right after. I miss the print Vanity Fair on the Graydon Carter. So many good writers and stories were in those pages. I read it cover to cover for years. R.I.P. Dominic Dunn and Christopher Hitchens. Couldn't agree more. I wasn't a great favourite of Christopher Hitchens, but I, and Christopher Hitchens was no favourite of mine, but I loved Dominic and Dominic, I think, liked me. So, and I loved his work. And in those days, Vanity Fair was sophisticated and glamorous. Everything it's not now. It was also independent. You know, ultimately, if you follow the herd, people discover that you are a sheep. If you want to be known as something more independent, you don't follow the herd. I just make that point for what it's worth. On your history lesson on Russia, that was very well presented, Lady C. Thank you. I enjoy getting the European perspective on this. As an American, and this is really interesting now, I loathed the foreign policies of Cheney and, and Rumsfeld, as you ought to have. My ex-husband, Bob, was the producer of the second Goodwill Games which brought athletes and cultural exchanges from Russia to Seattle. Host families housed many of the Russians. It was a huge endeavor and very successful. It was Bob's dream to bring our two nations together. After the games, he sponsored the launching of a Russian satellite that landed in our territorial waters to promote the Russian space capabilities to American commercial interests. To say the US government was unhappy with that, this stunt would be an understatement. He was called before a committee in Washington, DC, and told, you do not launch satellites, we do. You see, it's these revelations that are so important. And the wonderful thing about a forum like this is that one ends up getting absolutely wonderful feedback from people who are engaged and involved and informed. Remember when I got feedback from Givenchy? about the dress fitting and how Meghan treated Charlotte. Mm. And this, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Mary Walsh. Thank you. Joe Baird says, BRICS has been created to have a common currency against the US dollar, which was taken off the gold standard so is a fiat currency not worth the paper it is printed on? Economists are predicting the collapse of the US dollar, stock market and banks, etc. These countries are trading in oil using their own currencies rather than the previously agreed US dollar. Joe Baird, that's one part of why it was created. Another part of why it was created was by forming an alternative bloc. Not only is it in these countries' financial interests, 
it is in their political interests. They have more weight. Two against one is murder. Do you remember that? Well, if you have a counterbalance, it has not only economic weight, but political gravitas. Now, of course, BRICS is heading in the direction of the common market that we had in Europe which was a great success and it's turned out to be a huge mistake to have converted the common market from an economic bloc into something more uniformly political, which of course has caused huge problems in Europe because France and Germany dominated the European Union until Britain got in. And France and Germany, even when Britain was in the European Union, first of all, the common market, then the European Union, France and Germany each hoped to be ultimately the leader of the European common market, then the European Union. And it used to be said in uh, elevated political circles. The Germans are aiming for leadership and the French intend to pip them at the post the way they always do. And, but that was disastrous in terms of the other countries. For instance, Greece. When Greece had a referendum and voted for certain economic policies, France and Germany just overrode them and said, we don't care what you have voted for. You're going to do what we want. Dictating to them. That's dictation. That is almost dictatorship, really. But... BRICS is also covering not only the economic aspects because, and there has been, may I say, because one of my sons is in the financial world, and there has been grave concern not only at the state of the dollar, but at the fact that the Western powers have been trying to get rid of cash because if you get rid of cash everybody has to use a card and everybody can therefore be controlled and monitored so there's been that as well and there has been uh, the creation of I forget what they're called, bitcoins, but it's not bitcoin, the, that sort of currency. I forget what it's called. I'm very un, unfinancial. But the uh, alternative coinage. And there are plans afoot to try to have that as a means of of exchange as well as and as well as cash and and the russians have are trying to create an alternative to the swift process who can blame them you know you you de deprive people of the means to function in one way might be surprised when they come up with the ability to function in another but that's not only what the summit is about because aside from uh, the deepening of financial cooperation uh, and the creation of alternatives to the western dominated payment systems there are efforts being made to 
to dampen down and resolve regional conflicts and for for not only the conflict in Ukraine but other conflicts as well where I mean you have for instance China and India are both involved and China and India are basically adversaries if not enemies they've often been enemies but they are both in bricks so it I hope you begin to see it's a lot more layered and a lot more complex than people might think it is. And at the moment, the alliance includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and it's Egypt, Iran, Ethiopia, the United Arab Emirates. Notice that very, very Muslim religious. Saudi Arabia is supposed to be joining. Turkey, Azerbaijan, Malaysia have all applied to become members. We are looking at a tectonic shift in economic as well as political power. And I'm in favor of each nation protecting its own interests and each nation having the right to its own identity. And I think regime change is an impertinence that's, and, and a sign of arrogance that history shows has never, ever been a desirable objective, except in the very shortest of terms. Let's see what happens, because there is a growing interest in these nations to not be cowed by the West. There's also every reason why nobody wanted to be cowed by the Soviet Union. I say that for what it's worth as well. And I, like many other people, could not have been more thrilled when the Soviet Union collapsed and with it all the oppressed satellite states. But being a satellite state becomes very dangerous when the primary state, the overdog, starts to tell you, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. When, it's, when they are telling you things that are not in your nation's best interests, like creating enemies when we should be having friends. I'm all in favor of peace and I don't care how it is achieved as long as it is achieved in a positive way. And on. So now I will read out what Marina Zhenenskia says. Hope I got that right. An approximation, please. Dear Lady C, I am proud to say that I am a Russian and watch your videos from Moscow. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the factual information about Russian history. You are one of the very few sources on the English speaking segment of YouTube who tells the truth about Russia. Thank you very much for that. I confirm every word you said about our history and political situation. 
and we are really very sad that we had to part our ways with Europe. Best wishes to you, your boys and fur babies from Russia. Thank you very much for that. Well, as I just said, <laughs> I was jubilant about the downfall of the Soviet Union. And I do not believe in the demonization of people who want to be our friends because it's in one or two greedy people's interest to have them cast as enemies. I would like to see all the European states pulling together in a harmonious way, respecting each other's differences as well as engaging with our similarities. That is the only way to have a civilized society. Everybody can't be the same. You know, we have had a series of fallacious philosophies politically that have been so injurious to the well-being of humanity that we really need to learn the lessons of history. And I hope we will learn the lessons of history. And to those of you who think that we in the West have a right to demean, diminish, and deplore people who have different values and different cultures. I'm sorry, it's not so. And we have made so many serious mistakes in my lifetime, chief of which was toppling the Shah and replacing him with an Islamic theocracy of the most extreme nature. But hopefully, ultimately, with the passage of time, things will loosen up in Iran as well. I'm friendly with many Iranians. I know some of their royals. They are great and ancient people. When we in Britain were running around like savages, painted with gold and wearing animal skins, the Persian Empire was one of the greatest empires on earth with a level of civilization that was virtually unmatched and certainly was far superior to ours in Britain. I just make that point for what it's worth. Hopefully when people of different beliefs get together, they will have influence upon each other. And the average Iranian would like to have a loosening up of that rigid theocracy. With time, hopefully that will happen. And in the meantime, the British, the French, and the Americans need to understand that their governments are the ones who created that crisis. So, I hope I'm not being too heavy. Oh, keeps lighter questions coming in as well. I don't want to be too heavy. I don't want uh, to, you to feel that uh, let's have both 
light and heavy together, shall we? Or, uh, well, at least some light. And I hope that insofar as the Harry and Meghan saga is concerned, you understand where I'm coming from on that. It's too convenient that these uh, divorce rumors have been planted when Charles and Camilla have been on the Samoan and Australian tour. And on that note, I'll say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please keep the questions and comments coming in so I will know what you would like us to be speaking about. Okay, thank you so much. Godspeed. And if you have truly enjoyed this, would you care to like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and take good care. Bye-bye.